Uh, well, good evening. I want to thank you guys for coming out. Uh, this, uh, I guess, is our own version of March Madness. Uh, can everyone hear me? Cool. Well, I usually scream. You can usually hear me clear across the room, so it shouldn't be any problem. But if there's a problem, just wave. Um, I want to elaborate on something that Sally was saying about the house detective. The house detective has moved in-house to Memphis Heritage. So from now on, uh, if you uh, want to hire the house detective, uh, you call Memphis Heritage, you call June West over here, uh, and Memphis Heritage gets a, per a percentage of the, uh, of the uh, price of the uh, house history. I also do uh, commercial buildings downtown. Uh, I traced one man's, uh, actually he wanted to know every place that his mother had worked. Uh, well, it was very touching. She uh, was, her husband, uh, it said she was a widow, but they were Catholic and it was the 20s and he walked out on her and like five kids, so they put deceased in the city directory. Uh, and then she had to go and start working, and, and uh, so I traced her, like her, her working, uh, and she worked down on Beale Street in a secondhand clothing store, and I was doing some research for another project the other day, and I saw this picture, and I thought, I bet you a nickel that's where his mother lives. So they went from living out in Highland Heights uh, to being uh, in Lauderdale Courts because they were poor, and you know, here she was with five kids, so I'm sure she qualified. But then I started speculating, what if she'd have met Elvis, and instead of taking the life he did, what if he'd have married this lovely widow with five kids and just been an electrician? So at any rate, that sounds like there's a movie script in there somewhere. Uh, so um, we uh, wanted to uh, talk about Central Gardens. It's such an amazing uh, uh, historic district and certainly has uh, a lot of the most wonderful building stock. Um, I, of course, drew the uh, short straw, so I'm doing uh, the, uh, the early development. And let me tell you what, guys, I've been in the library uh, time after time, uh, and the images that you're going to see here tonight <laughs> were not easy to come up with. The other thing I discovered uh, was that uh, there was a lot of misinformation about the early settlement of Memphis. Uh, there was a lot of misinformation about like how big the property was that A.B. Carr bought versus how much Rozelle, Mr. Rozelle, who was probably actually smart enough to buy Central Gardens, uh, uh, the actual proper Central Gardens. Uh, you know, so uh, I, I kept on going back and forth, and, and as late as this afternoon, I was still sitting there trying to work things out. So uh, what I'm going to do here is, is try to explain things to the best of my ability. We're going to have plenty of uh, time for questions afterwards because my co-presenter, uh, Michael Sakuro, called me. He was in San Diego at a very elegant hotel drinking a mojita with his wife who was on a banking holiday. So um, at any rate, so, so what you see is what you get here. Uh, so um, we all know this. This is one of the beautiful entrances into Central Gardens on one of the premier streets, Belvedere. Uh, but now what I'm going to look at tonight is early. I thought there was a lot more antebellum architecture over there than there turned out to be, but I have come up with three. And if anybody knows of another one, please feel free. Uh, and then we're going to look at some later uh, uh, post-Civil War development. But it's kind of fun, and I think you might find a, a couple of things in here that you didn't know before. All right, so, oh, there we go. Uh, so <laughs> I went looking for A.B. Carr, and I found him on a light post. Uh, th this, uh, sadly enough, is, is about it, but at least he has a street name. Uh, so A.B. Carr uh, uh, came to Memphis uh, with his brother. They were actually traveling down to Louisiana by flatboat, uh, and they got here, and they heard that uh, the Chickasaw cessation, uh, which was finally signed uh, in 1819, which basically uh, uh, Andrew Jackson and General Shelby uh, uh, bought all the land from the Mississippi to the Tennessee River. I think it was, uh, it was a lot of acreage for like four and a half cents an acre. Talk about a deal. Uh, so the cars uh, decided that Memphis might be a great place to, uh, to come in and, 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 and settle. Um, so anyway, uh, other uh, early uh, settlers here uh, was Mr. Rosdell, Solomon Rosdell. We'll be hearing a lot more about him. Uh, and then Roland Street, which um, I always wondered about Roland Street. I'm like, where did they get that name? Uh, anyway, uh, you're going to find out in a little while that it's someone's middle name. Uh, and there, of course, is Central Avenue. And Central Avenue uh, was one of the two oldest streets in the area. That and Lamar were actually both Indian trails uh, and were improved by the 
the early settlers. So uh, basically, this is pretty much, and then I, I do like this one. This is my favorite one. Uh, this uh, is at the corner of Peabody and Willette, uh, which was formerly Harris Avenue, uh, and that formed the western boundary of the, the Harris uh, uh, home and, and property there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think the V and most of the E are gone, but nonetheless, there it was, buried in cement. So um, there's pretty much the, the traces of the, the original uh, uh, pioneer settlers there. Uh, I won't call them the first uh, uh, folks because actually the first inhabitants were were the uh, uh, American Indians, or I'm sorry, the Aboriginals, whatever we want to call them, the Marians, uh, were here. Um, Actually, by the time the Europeans got here, um, I think the area was pretty much deserted. Uh, I believe it was probably used as hunting grounds. Uh, the uh, Indian mounds, which we see fancifully uh, uh, depicted here uh, down on, on the bluff, uh, there actually used to be a lot of them. They were uh, demolished by the uh, Union Army to make breastworks. But um, by the time uh, the Europeans got here, uh, most of the original inhabitants ha had moved from the area. So um, not everybody knows this. First of all, this is the fourth Chickasaw Bluff. Uh, and this is only the fourth place on the river uh, that the bluff actually reaches out and touches the river. The rest of the places, the bluff is real recessed. So uh, this was uh, named Chickasaw for, for the Chickasaw Indians who were actually latecomers to the area. Uh, first, we were claimed by the French. Uh, then the Spanish got involved. They actually built a fort here. Uh, Great Britain came in, uh, and then finally the U.S. So uh, we've flown several flags here over time. Uh, and uh, the traces of, of the uh, original inhabitants are pretty much uh, confined to Chuckalissa and the DeSoto Mounds uh, and a few uh, uh, trails that were once uh, uh, leading them. Uh, this uh, is a beautiful map. Uh, this is a, a late 18th century French map. It's probably done about 1795, showing uh, Fort San Fernando uh, de las Barrancas, uh, which is, oh, okay, now I get to get out the thing that I wait all year to use. It's my pointer. Let me find it here. Okay. Uh, this uh, is the uh, original fort, uh, and as you can see, this is done in the older style. Uh, actually, I think this is pretty good. You can, can, can pick off people as they come at you from several different ways. Um, so this uh, uh, is the uh, wolf uh, coming into the, uh, the, the Mississippi, and I don't know if that's Mud Island or not. I, I don't think so, but who knows. Uh, we'll just assume it was the map maker's fancy. Um, and then you can see there is some habitation here. Uh, it, I believe it says hospital. There were some settlers. There were some uh, veterans of the Revolutionary War who settled here. Uh, Andy Jackson had promised them that they could all have land uh, because he was a part owner here. Of course, uh, he didn't really make good on that claim uh, and actually had to give up ownership of his share of Memphis because at one time he owned 50% uh, of, of the rice, uh, yeah, of the rice grant, uh, and that was this area. Uh, and then you can see the proposed new fort down here, uh, which I think uh, later became uh, Fort Adams. Uh, and I'm not sure if that ever got built, but ultimately, down here a little bit more at Fort Pickering, they, they built a, a fort. It was called Fort Pike originally uh, uh, in honor of uh, Zachary Pike, who will let, I think his claim to fame was he found uh, Pike's Peak. Uh, at any rate, it was changed to Fort Pickering in honor of uh, some esteemed American general. Um, so, uh, and actually Fort Pickering looked pretty much, I, I've seen uh, some drawings of what was left because it stayed around, remains of it till the 1850s. Uh, so it, it, was, it was very similar in construction to this. So this, uh, I believe, is probably our earliest map. Is that the Gayosa Bayou um, right there on the top? That little well, actually, you, that's there. an excellent point. Yes, that would be the Bayou Gayosa, which is our biggest river, uh, and that's the wolf, and uh, it's all coming out there together very nicely. Today, the Bayou Gayosa we know is Danny Thomas Boulevard because it's been uh, channelized. So, um, and then I found these beautiful drawings, okay? Uh, this is a view of Memphis circa 1825 drawn from the south. So, um, you're, you're coming up the river in your flat boat. Well, actually, hopefully your flat boat. Uh, uh, and somebody else is, is doing the polling and, and you're coming into town. Uh, so, yeah, Arkansas would be um, 
that away. Uh, and then this is the mouth of the wolf, which is now North 2nd Street. Um, and as you can see, uh, there's some dugout canoes there and some spinely trees and uh, some very rustic uh, housing. Uh, this is now uh, where the uh, Cannon Performing Arts Center is, folks. Uh, a PowerPoint, <laughs> even in 1825, I like to think that those two trees right there mark the entrance. Uh, but, and, and the cliffs, I have to tell you, I have read accounts of these cliffs from the really early uh, settlers, and they talked about them, the colors, the, the clay was like purple and orange and red, and there was, there was vegetation. It was just really exciting. Exotic. Uh, uh, so unfortunately, we don't really get that from these line drawings, but what we've got is what we've got. So, uh, and then I think we have a couple more. Uh, this is a view from the north. Uh, so you can really see the bluff down there, okay? And there is Memphis. <laughs> and, and there's the flat. You know, there was actually a keelboat war here in the 1840s um, as, as they fought over uh, a wharfage fees. Uh, they wanted to, uh, uh, well, at one point it moved down to Fort Pickering. The, the, the river actually changed course and uh, the sandbar that they were uh, uh, tying up on moved down there. Uh, but in the 1840s, the, uh, the keelboatman, I don't know if anybody here remembers David Davy Crockett, King, uh, I'm Mike Fink, King of the River. Well, obviously these guys were pretty nasty and they got in this huge a fight and, and the sheriff got involved and the mayor uh, and finally uh, they uh, actually got the militia out on them and ended up moving the wharf down to what we know today uh, as the uh, cobblestones uh, and these guys were forced to pay wharfage fees or get out of town. So, um, you know, people are always after that. So here's the early settlement, uh, and I looked at it really carefully, and I think this might be uh, the Bell Tavern over there. Uh, and quite frankly, I don't recognize any of the rest of this, but it's very rustic looking. Uh, and I hate to think what that black uh, a liquid is coming out of there. We'll just, some things are probably better left unsaid. But at any rate, so this is Memphis in 1824, uh, and, and, and the cars, uh, uh, have already been here. Okay, this is the wharf in 1850. Uh, as you can see, uh, it is really uh, uh, the center of the action down there because that's how the, that's where the cotton meets the river. And, and Memphis, New Orleans, uh, St. Louis, uh, probably even Chicago, so many cities uh, that are located uh, on the Mississippi River uh, are, are, you know, indebted to the Mississippi for their creation because without the river, before you had trains or anything else, you had the, the river and the uh, transportation uh, opportunities that it afforded you. So uh, without, uh, without the river, we just really wouldn't be here. Okay, cars track. So uh, today's Central Gardens was originally a part of North Carolina. Uh, European settlers, uh, and actually North Carolina saw Tennessee as a big cash cow uh, because they had uh, like a financial panic in the 1780s. So um, they started selling off tracts of land, 5,000 acres, 10,000 acres, but you really weren't allowed to be in this area because the, uh, the uh, Aborigines had not been uh, uh, removed, as it were. Uh, so uh, you really couldn't come in here, but they went ahead and sold these. Uh, so uh, pioneer uh, Andrew B. Carr and his brother Thomas uh, settled here uh, in 1819. That like the I think the cessation was the session was actually signed in January, and they came in and grabbed 1,600 acres of virgin land immediately east of the Rice Grant uh, uh, as soon as they could claim it. The boundaries of Carr's property were present-day uh, East Parkway on the east. Cane Creek on the south, which is basically uh, South Parkway down there. You know it's channelized. Um, and then uh, you've got the old Raleigh Road Bellevue on the west uh, because that was the, the, the property line for the, for the Rice and the Ramsey Grants and Union Avenue on the north, uh, including present-day Central Gardens. As early as 1835, the cars made the first improvements to the original Aboriginal Trail in the area, now Central Avenue. Lamar Avenue was also the Chickasaw Trail from Mississippi uh, uh, to the river. Um, I think it went down to something like Pontotoc or something. So uh, it was a very well-traveled uh, uh, trail. Uh, and we're going to see a map a little bit later that will illuminate these just a little bit better. Uh, and then um, 
Solomon Rozell, um, according to what I was reading, uh, actually got here in 1820 uh, with his family. Uh, but it wasn't until 1830 uh, when uh, a land speculator defaulted uh, on his payments to Mac John McLemore, who was one of the other proprietors uh, in uh, A.B. Carr. Rozell uh, came in and bought 803 acres for $10 an acre. So what is that? 8000 300. You couldn't buy a driveway in Central Gardens today for that, okay? Uh, it was, he purchased the top half of Carr's property. Because I looked at this, everybody kept on saying that, that Rozell bought the same thing that Carr did. And I'm like, no, that's not right. So the, the uh, southern boundary was what today we call the Norfolk Southern Line. But uh, originally, he just had a line going through there. Uh, and then he... Uh, uh, he deeded uh, that uh, the the edge of his property down there is right away for the uh, first railroad, which is the old Memphis and Lagrange, uh, which today is known as the Norfolk Southern Line. Uh, Rossell Station actually stood there uh, at Willette and Lamar, um, and that's where his cotton crop was shipped out to market. Uh, Rossell's original home was at Lamar and Southern, where the railroad track intersects. Uh, I went down there, I was going to take a picture, and I'm like, nah, I don't think so. So uh, Rozelle's original home uh, was down there because they love living on the railroad line. I guess it was like uh, having access to, to the interstate or light rail today. Uh, it was not a bad thing to live on the railroad line. And, and several people, uh, Mr. Um, well, I can't think of that guy's name now. Uh, the, the, the other house down there, there's another, Rayner. Uh, Mr. Rayner actually had a cotton plantation in Collierville, and he would just ride the train out there and come back in the evening. Uh, so uh, in 1853, Rozelle built a very fashionable Gothic revival new home on Harbert uh, uh, shortly before his death. Uh, and then this is his obituary here. Uh, and usually, let me tell you what, they didn't do obituaries in the 19th century, so you can see what, what people really thought about Rozell. Uh, at his residence near the city on Tuesday last, Solomon Rozell, one of our oldest and most highly respected citizens. So I assume that means he passed. Oh yeah, he died at a very advanced age and has left behind him a large and highly respectable family of children besides the partner of his bosom. Uh, this is the Memphis Daily Appeal, August the 28th, 1856. Now, that's a pretty nice obituary, folks. Uh, and then Rozell um, was, was uh, if, this is very interesting, Mr. Rozell was illiterate. Uh, uh, he uh, could not read nor write. I, I, I have a feeling he could do math, though. Uh, but um, very early on, he and Tillman Bettis were elected to the uh, Board of Education. Uh, and so Bettis was, uh, uh, he owned the property uh, north of uh, Union. Uh, today, the Piggly Wiggly, the, the, the cemeteries up there. And I went up there uh, to take a picture of it, but it was so sad uh, and in such disrepair, I couldn't, even, I couldn't even do it. But Mr. Bettis, when he was, and then his little wives are all kind of around him there. He went through two or three, I think. Uh, but um, Mr. Bettis uh, played a trick on Mr. Rozelle because he knew that he could not read nor write uh, and got him elected to the school board. And Rozelle was, was not a very fun person, but you know, he took it in stride and he was a lot more serious about education because he could not read nor write th than Mr. Bettis who, who had that ability. So in honor of, of Mr. Rozelle, uh, the land where Rozelle School is today uh, uh, was, it was donated by the family. Uh, by one of his sons uh, in his honor. Uh, so, and if you go over there and, and you see Rozelle School, there's actually a much older building that faces Southern, and I think that was the original Rozelle School. It too faced the train track uh, and was on the perimeter of the property. So there's Mr. Rozelle. Now let's look at his beautiful home. Uh, this uh, is the Solemn Rozelle home. Uh, this is a twin gable uh, Gothic revival. Um, I do believe it's maybe lost some ornamentation. Uh, it just always seemed a little plain to me. But on the other hand, maybe he was a very austere person and uh, this is what he liked. But uh, the uh, Gothic revival style was very fashionable uh, uh, in uh, 
the 1830s to about 1860. This, this is getting kind of late, but we always got everything about 10 years later than anybody else did. So you've got the wonderful little bay window here. You have the, 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 the twin gables. Uh, you have uh, this entrance. This too is a little bit odd, but, but you've got this beautiful arched entrance. Uh, and you've got the, the, the gable decorations up here. So it's quite a beautiful home. Uh, and it, actually, it's on Harbert. Uh, so uh, he too chose to move to a very fashionable street uh, to, to build his home on. So uh, this, I believe, was a recipient of a Memphis Heritage Award a few years ago when uh, they did an astonishing re renovation there. I remember uh, being in there, so that was pretty fun. Did I miss one? Well, I don't know how to go back. Uh, okay, we'll just assume <laughs> we didn't miss one. Okay, so the thing that, that really uh, brought development to the Central Gardens area was indeed the railroad coming through here. Now, John uh, Christmas McLemore was the fourth progenitor uh, of, it's kind of like the fifth beetle. Nobody knows much about him, but uh, he uh, came along. Uh, he was a very uh, wealthy and attractive Nashville lawyer that came down here, was good friends with Overton and Jackson, and when Jackson had to bow out of owning the land here because of his treatment of the Revolutionary War soldiers and other things that people didn't like, uh, uh, Mr. McLemore came in uh, and bought quite a bit of his share. But Macklemore uh, wanted to show Overton, Judge John Overton, a thing or two. Uh, so he decided to build the rival town of Fort Pickering down uh, uh, on the river's edge, down where the uh, Marine Hospital is today in the, in the Metal Museum. So um, he, uh, uh, and, and he was in luck, the river changed course, uh, and there's a beautiful uh, uh, map that uh, every time I tried to put it on here, uh, it, would, it, it wouldn't do right, so you don't get to see it, but uh, there's a plat of the town of Fort Pickering, uh, and he actually has all the commercial buildings down on the water's edge. Bad move, John. Uh, so uh, not only does the river, you know, flood, uh, but uh, his sandbar moved away after a few years, and there went the commercial district. Uh, uh, so pretty much uh, we, we don't have a lot left from uh, Macklemore today, but he had this vision of getting the cotton out of here by train instead of on the river. Now the Ramsey Grant, uh, when it was divided among the seven uh, Ramsey children after John Ramsey passed away in uh, 1801, uh, the Ramsey Grant went from basically uh, what's today a uh, Bishop G.E. Patterson, formerly Calhoun, uh, down to uh, Person Street. So it was another 5,000 acres. Uh, so when they divided amongst the children, they, they did the line. Uh, each each uh, area was divided where everybody had access.